I'd like to welcome you back to our study in the book of Psalms. Today we are looking at Psalm 95, and I've titled this one, Joyful Noises and Hard Hearts. And those look like total opposites. Um, and yet you're going to see the connection today in a psalm that is not very long, but has great impact because it is the Word of God. This is the outline that we have on the book of Psalms. And uh, in the Hebrew Bible, it, the book of Psalms is five different books uh, that total the one. And you can see the markings, the division titles of the chapters and an outline from the Pentateuch. So the introduction I would share with you on this one is there is no author given on this psalm. Also, there are no musical instructions. There's no musical dedication listed in the pretext here. This psalm, uh, along with Psalms 29 and 92 and 93, and then 95 through 99, which we are part of now this series coming up, they were, were and they actually still are today used in the Sabbath worship each week in the Jewish synagogues. So these Psalms can be very, very fresh, but they can be very dated uh, and go back over 2,000 years, almost three. Chronologically, this psalm can fit in at 2 Samuel 5.5, and the date would be David, of course, around 1018 before Christ. The backstory, what's going on? David has now become king over all Israel and reigns out of Jerusalem. There is much joy in Jerusalem, and there's much rejoicing in all of this, but there is a warning from the Lord. And so let's get right into this. Here is the outline of this book. The first seven verses talk about sing to the Lord and we'll keep our hearts soft. And how true that is. Stand firm in the Lord and do not harden your hearts. So these will be verses and phrases out of the world. So let's get right into this psalm. Sing unto the Lord and keep our hearts soft. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. You probably can think of some songs and some choruses that have these phrasings in it. And we can sing about that in church. Actually, the word sing means definitely to sing, but to really sing out is what it's talking about. Don't hesitate. And then, of course, the Lord is Jehovah in the Hebrew here, which means the existing one. If you've been listening to these Psalms with me all along, you would know a lot of the Hebrew words and their meanings by now, especially the Lord Jehovah. And then he says, let us make a joyful noise. And so he makes, says, raise a sound for the Lord. And I have no idea what the sound is. It's not music. Maybe it was, maybe it is talking about musical instruments or drums beating. Um, but just raising their, ra making a, a sound, a joyful sound to the rock of our salvation. And salvation, is translated here from the Hebrew salvation, it can be, uh, but it also has the connotation of, of rescuing or delivering, and meaning rescuing or delivering us from hell. And, the Lord, and it's always talking about the Lord is first the rescuer and the deliverer, the salvation spiritually, but he does an awful lot of it physically too. And so all the way for the phrasing uh, rock of our salvation, is it's speaking of our security and our safety, that God, not, our, not only are we saved and secure in Christ, but we're, he's, we're under God's wing. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. And once again, you can think of some songs. I almost was ready to, to continue to sing one. Uh, the word presence always means face. Um, 
if we talk about being in the presence of God, we're in the face of God. We're before him. We, we're eyeball to eyeball. And so it's not a presence where we walk into a big gigantic room and it's eerie and we're afraid and and we can't look at anything. But it says, come before the face of the Lord. Come boldly with thanksgiving or with praise and make a joyful noise. That's the same thing again. Make a, a joyful noise unto him with psalms or song. Now we're told what kind of joyful noise to make. And it's, it's a psalm, a song. Sing, sing this psalm. Sing a song to the Lord. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. And great here means in magnitude and extent. So it's not just God is great in distance or God is great in an altitude going up, but God is great in every, every direction imaginable in every way. And the, the great God is God is mighty one here. And he is the king above all the gods. And here it's talking about, it's a small case. And oftentimes the rulers and the judges that were within the structure of the Jewish society and also outside in other nations, they, they were, they were uh, the word gods was used of them as rulers and judges. It would be the same word, but we would obviously prefer rulers or judges. And so our Lord is a great God, and it's used extremely often in the, in the Psalms to note that God is king and his kingship above everything. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. So strength is talking about a the strength of the hills is like a lofty place up in the hills, uh, uh, the peaks, uh, a safe place in the hills to go to. And so when it talks about the deep places in the first part of the verse, those are the foundations of the earth. And only God understands this because he created those. The sea is his and he made it and his hands formed the dry land, made fashioned it with his hands. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And down means to be on bended knee. And you'd say, well, that shows up again. Remember in Psalms, often things are, are actually repeated for emphasis, but in different wordage. And so we're to come, we're to worship, and we're to kneel down and to bend the knee, and then let us kneel before the Lord. And so we're on two knees. But it's all, it's all one transaction here. I don't know that that's the best word. It's, it's, one, it's one movement that we have when we come before the Lord. For he is our God, we're the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, and we have a comma there, and so we're going to be shifting into the next Roman numeral, and it's going to be a, 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 a plea that's, uh, hey, if you hear his voice, da-da-da, and we'll get that in a minute. The, for The Bible says, for we are the people of his pasture. Um, it's not, in this case, it's not, the place, but it's the event that's going on. We are people of the Lord's pasturing or shepherding of his watch care and he was taken care of. So it's not the place that the sheep walk in and eat in, but we're there in that situation, but the, we're the people of his pasturing, shepherding. He has unique inter interests in each and every one of us. So God is both creator and shepherd here. And now we're asked to listen and to act as we move on. So stand firm in the Lord and don't harden your hearts. So often we understand the gentleness and, and the softness of a sheep and of, of being. And we've just talked about a shepherd sheep relationship with the Lord that we have and the joyful things and sing praises to the Lord. And we think of beautiful pastures to look in great scenes, hiding places high up in the hills, out in the mountains somewhere. And so they all paint wonderful pictures. But, and, but
but we are also called as God's people to stand firm in the Lord. But in standing and taking a stand for the Lord, we are not to harden our hearts. So he says, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. And so there's a, a, a reference back further in time. And first of all, the word harden means to actually don't harden your heart or don't sever, sever, sever your hearts, your relationship that you have with the Lord, your inner man, as in the, as in the provocation, which is talking about strife or contention, times that you would get angry and, and things would make you hot and you'd be tempted and not act just really right. And so the referral is, is what is talking about is Moses and the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. Meribah is mentioned in the Bible as is Massa. And it's inter interesting that the Hebrew word for provocation is Meribah. And the word in the Hebrew for temptation is Massa. So Meribah was a place of water from a rock. And Masa is the place of water from a rock from Moses. Uh, so we can see this in temptation is testing or despairing. So he's saying when you go through some rough times and you're in, test, you're in temptation or you're in testing and you're in despair, he said, don't harden your hearts. Keep your hearts soft. When your fathers tempted me, prove me and saw my work. It means examined or tried. And so note in verses 8 and 9, the reference uh, is to the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, especially with Moses and at where Moses had the rock, uh, the water come out of the rock. And hardening our hearts is to turn from God and live as we want, not as he wants us to. Here's the 40 years reference. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. And this is the Lord speaking. The word err means wandering in their hearts. As they wandered in the wilderness, they wandered in their hearts and went astray. And he goes on and talks to them and says, They have not known my they've not learned my ways. They don't know me. They've forgotten. They've not decided to spend time. And the way the word ways is always paths or a life journey. They don't know the life that I've laid out ahead for them, the wonderful life I've laid out. They're not willing to trust me. And so they've wondered. Unto whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And as, as, bef as being before the Lord was his face, the wrath is his nostril. Think of fire coming out of smoke coming out of a nostril of anger and so he whom i swore in my nostril my anger my wrath that they should not enter or go into my rest or my resting place or quietness and so a good way of just saying this rest could could be like sitting at home and or it could be knowing we are just safe in the lord it's a it's a it's a safe place it's a quiet place that we like, and we all have one of those that we go to just to be alone. And it bespeaks of that with the Lord. So that wraps this up. It's a short psalm, but it's a powerful psalm. And so my question is, where, where's your joy level? And my second question is, is, are you steadfast in the Lord, but still resting and you're not angry? And you're fighting, the, the these latter verses were fighting battles and and there's temptations and testings that we go through as Christians. How do we handle that and what do we do with it? Do we come out of it still singing or do we come out of it very angry with the Lord? So God bless you. If I can help you in any way, here's my email address. And I pray that I'll see you again in 96, the next psalm. And we'll pray together now. Father, thank you so much for this psalm. Each one is a separate blessing to us. And within it are great challenges, encouragements to us, things to point needs and, and where we need you to work in our life. So, Father, I pray, may we have joyful hearts and may we have steadfast ones.
that are joyful in the midst of the battle. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.